our other important context, and, and that is both all of us and, and to some extent, I think uh, eMERGE has uh, shared and learned and contributed to the, um, the vanguard of uh, large scale cohort uh, sequencing, which would be the VA's MVP. And so we have the, uh, the wizard of MVP, Mike Gaziano is here uh, to give us an update on that project. Thanks, Dan. It's really been a, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and it's been a, a pleasure to exchange with Emerge and to get, a, and get an update on all of us um, to, to, and to exchange um, uh, uh, best practices in this space. We also agree that uh, EHR data is really very valuable. Um, we, we had our coming out party at the ASHG. We did a two-hour symposium on the first night and presented 22 abstracts. And it, what, what, I, what the story, the basic story for the early MVP data is that the standard epi works and the genetic epi works um, similar to what others have seen in, in um, um, more traditional cohorts or consortia of cohorts. So I'm going to breeze through a number of slides on where we are in, um, uh, in general with MVP, um, where we're going with um, complex uh, phenotyping, and then a little bit about um, you know, providing access. So if you, if you remember, we collect health and lifestyle information from the participants and a blood specimen. We access the medical records forward and backward in time, and we can recontact the participants. Now, the, we don't get the kind of extensive data that all of us get, um, but we do get some questionnaire data on most of our participants, but not all. And, and we've got a, a big web contract to uh, expand the capability, though we think that our population is not quite as, it's going to be nearly as, as web savvy as the, um, the all of us cohort. So um, this is a little scrunched up given the, the, uh, the formatting, but uh, we're at, at 65 main sites and 60 satellites around the country. And here's where we are. We're at actually 612,000 people um, recruited. We hold genotype everybody. We've got, uh, we'll be releasing the second tranche of data on about 500K uh, genotypes on the AFI platform, similar to what the UK Biobank is using. We've got contracts out for 45,000 um, whole genomes. Um, and uh, on our way to 100K, we think we have funding this coming year, fingers crossed, and the subsequent year to get us to 100K whole, um, whole genomes. And then we're in discussions with a potential collaborator for a very large number of um, whole exomes. Uh, we are doing, we've got a, a, a contract release with Metabolon to do piloting of several thousand and in discussions um, with um, proteomic um, leaders. And we've got a microbiomic um, pilot underway. Um, again, these are going to be in, in hundreds of individuals. We have 20 teams accessing the data. Um, and the, the big constraint there is our computing environment. It's, it's all still behind the fire wall, but we will be moving, um, we'll go live with the, with the Department of Energy on November 17th. Um, uh, on November 17th, our VA investigators will be able to access, starting with the core team and then more investigators, access our data that has been stood up at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I was there on last Tuesday and got to see Titan, the country's biggest computer, and then Summit, with, um, where, the, where the, the IBM racks will be for the, the hopefully world's biggest computer. Um, and I mentioned that we presented a number of abstracts, and we'll present another 10 at the AHA, about 50 abstracts out. So we, the, 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 the science is moving at, while recruitment is still going on. This is the mainstay of our omics backbone, which is the Affymetrics um, array. We've imputed to the phase three of 1,000 genomes, but we hope to be able to impute to um, more African-American um, heavy cohorts, including our own, um, in the coming months. And this is the basic model, um, similar to what um, Stephanie described. We're keeping our data in our space. We have a model for the, the, the data coming into our, 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 our landing zone and, and library, and then we provide it to investigators as they come into the space. Right now, that's in Genesis. It's in a Pittsburgh cluster. And unfortunately, it's behind the VA firewall. So you have to be either a paid or a non-paid VA employee to actually get into our computing environment. That's, but that's changing soon. We will be in the Department of Energy space, which will provide broader access. And then we're in the process of creating um, a, um, a, a, an arrangement for a, a cloud-based data commons, which will provide even broader access. So here's our data universe. I talked about the molecular data. Our, uh, above the equator is what we collect under consent. Below the equator is the administrative data. I'll just to give you a flavor um, of what th this is the health system. And it's the largest healthcare system. Um, we, we have about half of the 21 million veterans uh, at some time use the system. Eight to nine million use it in a single year. Um, and we have data headed to the corporate data warehouse from four regional data warehouses. 
And it's, um, right now that number is up to 24 million users over the last 20 years with 8 billion labs and 3 billion nodes. And that presents some unique challenges for us as we um, en enter into the, the library and curation of the data. We have to get a lot of permissions, even from within the VA. There are various data landlords. The corporate data warehouse is the bulk of the electronic medical record. The only thing that doesn't come forward from many of the hospitals is the, Im the actual images. They stay local, um, although you can access them. Either bring them forward if you have uh, uh, funding and a place to put the image data or, or even potentially do analytics. But there are a number of other registries, actually about 120 different registries within the system, HIV registry, diabetes registry, a registry of all cardiovascular procedures that have different data landlords. And then we have uh, other data sets, uh, DOD, um, uh, um, CMS. We've worked our way through getting general permissions from, for the top of the list, but, but certainly not all of them. Now the data um, is structured data on a small fraction, but most of the data is actually quite messy. Um, and we've developed three cores. One is to wrangle the data. Um, the Phenomics Data Group wrangles the data and is actually doing the library creation. Um, not only the complex phenotypes, but an extensive library that I'll show you in the next um, um, slide. Then we have the, 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 uh, the, the team doing simple structured data curation, and then we have the complex, the, the third core. Um, we, we've engaged uh, Zach Kohaney's group and uh, Kat Leal and Tanchi Kai to do our complex phenotyping, moving to scalable language processing and um, automated intelligence that I'll talk about um, in a bit. So this is the general library. We have actually, uh, Terry Manoli and I were over in the UK talking about um, how many phenotypes do we have? Well. We think if you add up all the numbers, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of variables, whether we call them phenotypes or not. But 100,000 variables, if we add all the, the, the procedure codes and the ICD codes, um, the lab values, the medication codes, which actually get complex. But we've begun to library them. And I'll, I'm going to walk through a few examples of how we work through that data set. So for labora laboratory adjudication, we use OMOP. There is an OMOP overlay to the VA, but I'm, I would um, caution using OMOP as the, as the, as the architecture for um, the, the, the library. Um, OMOP probably works better in EHRs that have a, uh, a less diverse uh, input of the data, say a single health system, and a, a less duration. But over 20 years, and one of the examples is the lab values. We have 8 billion labs, 400,000 terms that are mark those 8 billion labs. And we have a, 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 a detailed structure of how we move our way through the labs. Now, we're moving our way through the top 150 labs in the system. And, and by way of example, um, al serum albumin has 4,141 terms in the database that say albumin in it. And so we have to get through a cleaning. Now, if we just took the OMOP terms, you would end up with an awful lot of, of noise in with the signal, because only 644 of those are actually serum albumin. So what we end up doing is, we, we do a, call, a calling based on names where there's a qualifier that tells us it's not it's serum it's not serum albumin it's it's urine albumin or CSF albumin or or uh, peritoneal fluid etc. Then we have to get to the candidates and we actually have a clinician we hope to be able to audit. We have two clinicians reviewing the mean, median, a number of rows and there's a checkbox that they check and the two clinicians must agree to get to the 644. It doesn't take that long but we would like to automate that process. So medication adjudication is actually quite complex as, as well. Um, but, but the PBM has done some of that for us. And I'm not going to give you a, 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 um, a, a detailed specific example. But we have um, um, a, a, as um, complete for a, a, a number of the common drug types. But there's eight or different types, eight or nine different types of erythromycin, for example, eye ointment, um, uh, IV, oral, topical that all end up with, with, in the same term with erythromycin, but have to be um, really parsed out a little bit more carefully than that. And um, this is the, um, the, the, the basic uh, underpinnings of our medication adjudication process. But in the interest of time, I, I want to get to two complex, more complex examples. So as we curate the data, you have to sort of understand the potential, the timing of the, 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 day, the, the data drawn. This is work by Jason Bassey that shows you if you want a, a, a value such as blood pressure, 
that you end up getting uh, uh, about 90% of the people if you, if you choose within 60 days. Um, but remember, there's a little bit, a bit of biases. Whether it's labs or, or, or blood pressure levels, the sicker people at the hospital more often and have more of these values. So you, you have to open the window if you want to get a complete look at the entire population. And this shows both a two-sided and one-sided look at the distribution of blood pressures um, keying on a single point in time, for instance, enrollment. So smoking phenotype, um, we, we went through a number of, 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 of uh, uh, health terms. So each hospital is mandated to collect health factors, but there's not a, a single structure. So we found 1,600 different terms that say something about smoking from the different hospitals. We had to bin those into 11 categories. And then we use those to create this algorithm. And what you can see is um, that we, we keyed on high specificity of current users and high specificity of never users. And, and we uh, compared this against the one gold standard, which is our single point in time questionnaire. Now we're going back to try to get um, an area under the curve of smoking or smoking cessation uh, time periods. Um, but uh, th this is the, there, we've identified a dozen different um, smoking algorithms within the HR, but none of them have been validated. Now this one's been validated against several hundred thousand questionnaires. Um, for stroke, um, we create um, a, um, uh, some gold standards for a training set and a validation set, and then we've begun to use neural networks. Um, this is the, uh, the first example that we've been using um, some artificial intelligence to try to find the, uh, the best algorithm for and this gives you some comparisons. Um, this, is, this is our case control definition. I'm going to show you where we're, where we're really going is, is assigning a probability of caseness and non-caseness to every individual, and then setting the threshold according to the needs of the investigator. So this is what that looks like. So here's the, pro the probability of, of, of caseness is, is very high, of non-caseness is very high. This is an intermediate um, possible case, and then um, definite cases with, with some overlap. And so you can see where th thresholds are set. You can, you can end up with um, very clean uh, numbers of individuals with a, a high caseness. Now, we've been assigning a probabilistic caseness, which gives you the uh, opportunity to, to A, shift the, shift the thresholds, but B, it allows you to perhaps do some of the modeling, not with um, caseness as a, as a discrete variable, but as a probabilistic variable. And there's some suggestion with our, our collabor collaborators at Zach and Haney's group that that improves the modeling. PTSD is one where the Codes work very well. I'm not going to go into the, the detail, but there is a three-tier process that we use. An intuitive algorithm we start with. We find cases and non-cases validated. Then we build a second algorithm. Then we go through the validation process where we're assigning the probabilities of caseness. And we found um, uh, that the, the, um, the, the tier one algorithm actually worked quite well. We didn't get massive improvement when we went to a, um, a, 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 high tier a higher tier algorithm with more variables in the model. This gives you some of the data. Now here, this shows you how, you, again, you can use the data to, to define caseness. You can key on the number of cases you want and the sensitivity and specificity. This was what was settled on. So we end up with 16,000 cases of PTSD in the first uh, 350,000 uh, individuals and 43,000 definite non-cases. Now, if you, you'd end up with lower cases and higher sensitivity and specificity or in the other direction. And you can, do, you can model it with whatever way you like. And this is that process that we go through in a manual way. But we need to move to the next step, which is scalable language processing, which was going to be deployed in our, our um, um, Department of Energy space, automated feature extraction to get to the ability to create an automated feed pipeline. The, auto the way the automated pipeline briefly works, this is Kat Leal and Tanchi Kai's work, um, is um, you, out of, the, out of the, the, the rubbish bin, you do a, a cast a wide net and, and come up with all possible cases. You end up with a, that validated training set. This is the the time-consuming part, and they're, they're working on ways to, to um, e even speed up this process, presenting clinicians the data or finding cases like the ones that the clinicians originally um, deemed as cases. Um, and then we create a, there's a, valid, a training set and a validation set, and this is the, trying to be deployed as an, as an automated um, pipeline for doing that in a, what we call semi-automated way. We don't let, we don't let the, uh, the artificial intelligence machine um, just rummage over the rummage bin looking for correlations. It's constrained, constrained by certain variables and parameters. But we do allow the, a, a lot more latitude. And what the machine allows us to do is um, it, it allows us to decide what variables we need to spend time cleaning. And it may be the case that we don't have to 
clean very much. So this is my last slide, just the, the movement toward the, the idea of big data. And um, where is this happening right now? It's going to happen in the Department of Energy space. Um, as I said, we go live November 17th. But the next step is to take the, that library that I described on the one slide, port it to a data commons that's cloud-based, port the genotype data, and then um, make the access much more broadly available. You will no longer have to be a VA employee um, to touch the data. So it's, I'll stop there and answer any questions. It's a pleasure to be here to learn more about um, the, the field of phenomic medicine. So we, I think we have time for one question, and it goes to Lucilla. Yeah, I have a, a, a consolation uh, statement that transforming data is always hard, and from one system is always hard. So, so I think um, uh, the difficulty you've seen, we've seen as well. However, transforming to OMOP to us has been more rewarding than any other multiple common data models that we have uh, been doing. Uh, the reason being there are tools associated with it. And we also, you know, encourage um, uh, what we saw, the dissemination of the quality control um, algorithms that you guys used to deviate to everyone because it was very helpful. So Mary Woolley from UCSF has uh, introduced that to us. So that was more of a, a comment than a question. Yeah. So, so I, I think that we have to look at, you know, many ontologies. And I think some of them were designed on a single system, I2B2. Um, OMOP. Um, I think the, the, the utility is there as, as a potential starting point. When, when we did that, we did an experiment with PTSD. We actually started with OMOP for PTSD cases, and we found about half as many cases uh, as we, when we cast a broader net, not, not being restricted by OMOP. So you just have to, I think you have to be careful that, that, OMOP, it, that OMOP defines rough bins, which could be a very valuable entry point for your beginning. Um, I don't think it's, it should be. Um, viewed as a replacement for the complex um, curation of, oh, of phenotypes. Yeah, and I think it will evolve also as these various projects uh, define other needs, data they are not yet uh, in the common data format. So, so my real question was actually for, for NIH in terms of uh, I, I see a great value in having all of us, the MVP programs here, but what about the other programs, such as the CTSA and the, the NEO BD2K programs, is there an intent to have this all converge in, into a, a, a data commons? So there's, there's always the hope that that'll happen, Lucilla. As you, as you know, making it happen practically is a real challenge. Um, the CTSAs are, are actually represented around the table in, in eMERGE. Almost every eMERGE site has a CTSA. Uh, working with them to to reach commonalities has been a little more challenging than we would have liked. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about BD2K, because it, maybe, Eric, you could comment. It seems to be uh, the, the future is not quite well known. But I think what you're saying is we need to keep in mind that there are a, there's a broad variety of things out there that it would be really great if we could collaborate with and, and share models. It, would you agree that using the, the FAIR data standards and OMOP is a step in that direction? Uh, so Sharon and I have decided to invoke uh, Chair's prerogative uh, that uh, having finished our contextual uh, presentations, we think is actually a good time for a break now. So what we're going to do is take our 20-minute break, plan to reconvene at 10.15, and then we will launch with our panel presentations, which will be much more focused and deep slices. It will also give attendees a chance to... <clears throat> to ask your questions that we didn't have time for in the open session of our presenters. And I'd like to thank all of them for uh, a great foundational uh, context for the topics that will follow uh, in our, after our break at 10.15. <laughs>